I'm Brian Williams, and we're back with The Small Print, and today I am speaking to Ryan Wallman, and he's one of my favorite people from Twitter, and he's a bit of an unusual guest on the show since we usually stick to politics, philosophy, and economics, but trust me, I think this conversation is one that we all need to hear and to have. Now, on this show, Ryan, we like to get our guests to introduce themselves the way they like to be introduced, so would you do that for us? Um, sure. So, I'm Ryan. <laughs> Uh, I'm creative director at uh, a healthcare creative agency here in Melbourne. Um, I've been there for about 14 years um, in various different guises. Um, so essentially, yeah, I'm a creative director, but essentially a copywriter at heart. And I come from a, a, a medical background, so hence the healthcare angle. Um, yeah, and... I definitely know nothing about any of those topics that you just mentioned. So I'm definitely going to be a different Fantastic. guest. <laughs> yeah, just a little bit. But before you got into advertising, you actually worked in the healthcare profession, right? Yeah. So I trained in medicine and I worked as a doctor for about seven years, um, uh, predominantly in psychiatry. And then, you know, for various reasons, got out of that and, yeah, changed career and figured that, I mean, I wanted to be a writer, but I, I kind of figured that the easiest way to do that would be to try and bridge into, you know, into medical writing, um, which is what I did. And, yeah, it's kind of gone from there. The sort of writing that you get paid for, right? I mean, this is the Correct. scenario of the plan. But that's, that's, yeah, quite, exactly. the, <laughs> that's quite the origin story. Uh, like, it's not, that's, it's, it usually goes the other way around, right? So, you like, you do something else and then go do a sensible career in, like, medicine, law or accounting. <laughs> And you've had kind of the opposite trajectory, which I think is absolutely remarkable and, and definitely something I'm fully happy to, to lean in behind. Uh, you enjoy what you're doing at the moment? Yeah, very much so. Yeah. And, and yeah, the career change was uh, the best thing that I ever did, really. So, yeah. Well, that's, that's basically what, what I brought you here to talk about, because uh, although you are, as you say, you come from a medical background, you now work in advertising, you write things. But you also write very, very funny things. You are a particularly <laughs> funny person. And you don't only write adverts, you also wrote a book about the advertising industry not so long ago. I think that when you release it, just about the same time that COVID started. I also did a COVID book. I mean, what a, what a ridiculous time to try. Yeah, <laughs> I know. Well, I do out there when everyone else is. <laughs> I know. Fortunately, yeah, I, I did that. We published it just before kind of, you know, the world fell apart. So I think it was the end of 2019. Uh, so yeah, luckily I'd got it out of the way before that because I don't think I don't think I would, my head would have been in the right space to do it. <laughs> Otherwise, um, but yeah, yeah, it was uh, yes. It's about the advertising industry and kind of marketing more broadly. Um, and I don't know, you know, well, I don't know whether you, you've seen it, but you certainly would have seen a lot of the content from it because you know a lot of it I had put on Twitter in the in the kind of previous years and so on. So yeah, it's not a it's certainly not a very serious book. Um, but uh, there is some serious stuff in there, I would say. Yeah. So what is it called? So this is this is your opportunity to sort of pimp your produce. Plug. I mean, you've got to take it. <laughs> sure. Uh, so it's called Delusions of Branger. Um, Wonderful. Was... Well, what a title. Just take a moment <laughs> to appreciate that. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, yeah, which came out of one of the little satirical posts that I'd done kind of years ago. Um, and I was talking to the to the guy who published it for me or, you know, designed and published it. Uh, and we were kind of tossing around titles. And, and I said, well, I do really like this, but maybe it doesn't cover the extent of what the book's about. And he said, nah, that's what that's what we're going with. That's the best title. I said, okay, fine. So, yeah. Um, so what is it? It's, uh, it's essentially it's kind of a mix of of the satirical stuff that I've done as well as uh, articles that I've written for publications like Marketing Week and old blog posts and, yeah, that kind of thing. So it's a bit of a mix. It's certainly not a conventional marketing book. Um, I would never kind of uh, proclaim that it is. <laughs> um, but, yeah, it's, it's, uh, it, I think particularly with the way that it was designed, it, um, it's very immediately obvious that it is um, a different kind of book and, and, you know, it's meant to be entertaining above all else really. 
It's entertaining, but it's also like I would describe it as sort of draw, uh, dropping that sort of imaginary fourth wall around the industry and about not taking yourselves far too seriously. Because I think a lot of us that do work in any sort of corporate space or with anything where money is involved, we tend to take our work quite seriously and start to drink our own Kool-Aid and believe, <laughs> quite frankly, our own bullshits. And you just sort of completely strip that back and just sort of really pay back the, the immense hubris we have about particularly this intersection of the of like brands getting into politics and virtue, which is one of my favorite topics to rip into, which is where we have all sort of loosely, tenuously aligned with, with our show we're doing here and with your sure. content. And that I think yeah. that that's probably one of the, the less discussed, but also more important shifts that we're seeing in our society now, how I've sort of framed that conversation is the, the unseparation of church, brand and state, right? Like we don't really, <laughs> we don't have a society that's, that's run by the, the, the Catholic church and the guys in pointy hats anymore. We, we separated that, right? So we sort of put the church in its place and you could go there on Sunday and we left like Caesar's world to Caesar. And that's basically the way our civilization as we know it has sort of evolved since then. Evolved, sure. But so, but since then, in the last probably basically kind of after 2008 and the crisis that happened there, we've seen quite a dramatic unbreaking of those walls. But with a sort of third pole coming into place, so you've kind of got virtue on the one side that's sort of mingling with politics, which was always particularly trying to remove itself from issues of morality and focus itself on issues of law, what can be black and white, so it can be subjective and objective. And then you've also got corporate that's coming involved there and it's trying to play the role in many cases as sort of judge, juror and executioner on, on social issues. And it's been fascinating to work, watch the, the brand wagoning of everything, as, as <laughs> I like to call it. You know, like, you, like yes. you jump on the brand wagon and you sort of paint your logo the color of whatever cause is going on at the moment. Right now, you'd be, you'd be sort of trying to incorporate as much sunflower yellow and, you know, cornflower blue into your packaging as possible whereas yes, perhaps yes. last year you would have gone for some darker shades you know and before that maybe you would have gone for a full rainbow spectrum right I mean it's and, and it's hugely <laughs> cynical I do have a lot of conversations Absolutely. with people across the board about this and I think you share my my uh, perhaps less full commitment to the the, <laughs> the the virtue behind behind a lot of these these grabs for attention and for profit. And I love the way you approach it, particularly in your book and with a lot of your tweets that you've put out and your, your, your famous listicles that you love to publish <laughs> on these things. Fully appreciate your point of view. So I think you do see behind that curtain. And I, I and you've seen the funny side of it. I also tend to see the dangerous side of it. So when you when you get brands that are trying to take positions on issues of morality, which are by nature messy and imperfect, because there's when it comes to issues of values and morals, there's not clear black and white lines. It's much more nuanced than that. And when you see brands sort of tying their colors to the mast, it can be quite funny, but also it can be quite dangerous for people. Like right now, if you're in Russia, you, you, you can't access your own bank account or use your own sure. bank card, right? Because of sure. decisions politicians made that you had nothing to do with. You know, and that's a brand choosing, a brand choosing to get involved in that conversation. I want to unpack that a bit with you, but and we can perhaps start with the easier questions, which are like, does it work when it comes to, to brands doing these things? Well, and does it work not just in the short term, but in the long term? Because even things like printing record amounts of US dollars during COVID does work in the short term, but you know, a couple of years later, we now all have to eat much more expensive cake and, you know, we can't afford to drive our cars around anymore. You know, mm. causes have effects and actions have consequences. That'd be my first question for you. Does this work? Does the politic politicization of brands getting involved with popular, you know, causes and the color revolution that's going all around us, does it work? Mm. Mm. I think your color analogy is, uh, is a very good one. Uh, but yeah, I suppose the, the answer to that, uh, in you know, the short answer to that is again, as you say, it, it's nuanced. So as much as brands try to make it black and white, it is actually a nuanced answer to that. Sometimes it can work, and I guess it, it also depends on how you define, you know, working. And if you're talking about the effectiveness of it for the brand, then yes, it can work. I think whether it actually works in a broader sense and, and, you know, whether it is for the greater good, I think is much less clear in a lot of cases. But I certainly share your scepticism, shall we say. I mean, I'm probably more, more leaning towards cynicism 
um, about these things. I, I think you're exactly right that there is humour in it, um, but there is also a darker side to it and, and, and both the darker side in terms of what it says about those brands and I, and I think, you know, in, in particular, the fact that brands use it as a kind of purpose-washing exercise you know, you only basically you only have to scratch the surface of a lot of those causes that brands stand up for and and discover that you know they have very dark <laughs> other causes that uh, they have glossed over and and the purpose of, of a lot of those um, you know campaigns and so on is to is to detract from that from that stuff uh, and so you know I I use humour I think in some ways to to so that I don't have to confront those those darker sides of things head on because people get very angry about it when you when you do and you know sometimes even with my humorous stuff people get angry with me because they think that I'm being cynical and you know you just they're trying to do good why why do you have to attack them for it and all that kind of thing um probably the best person that I've seen writing about this is a guy called Steve Harrison I don't know if you um, have followed any of his stuff, but he wrote a book called um, Can't Sell, Won't Sell, uh, which was published uh, last year, I think, or the year before, um, which is just a fantastic kind of uh, expose of, of this kind of stuff and, and very um, scathing in some cases uh, about why brands are doing this and how effective it is. And so I can't talk to him in... To, in any way uh, as expertly as he does. So I, I would certainly recommend that one to you and, and to any of your listeners who are interested in, the, in this kind of thing. Yeah, Steve's well, fantastic. You could just lean right into the comedy angle and go watch the Bo Burham comedy special that he wrote during COVID lockdown, oh, right? I mean, he had a marvellous <laughs> song about joining wheat thins on the sort of in the, in the fights against Lyme disease and how we don't sort of sell products anymore. We try to wrap them in a cause. So the product almost becomes secondary to whatever the, the message, the marketing or marketing department or advertising agent is sort of trying to package around this completely yeah. cynical consumer good. Yes, it's fantastic that that song that he did yeah it's amazing uh, and there are a couple of other really good um videos and things that that have done been done recently but not even people in the marketing industry have obviously seen straight through this stuff um you know i can i can give you some links to, and things to those but yeah i think uh, i think that's the thing you know consumers and the general public have cottoned onto this as well it's not just those of us you know that are in the industry and, and, are, and are questioning it yeah, but that is an interesting point to pick up on because it's a bit of a recursive loop that goes on there. What we see quite quickly is that when you have these sort of contentious moral issues that are happening in society, it's quite it's quite quick that we try and sort of say this is these are the good guys, this is team hashtag good, and this is team hashtag bad, and you know you got to like pick a side very very quickly. But a lot of those opinions are informed by marketing and media, which I think are very closely related on the one hand, and then adopted by consumers and then sort of fed back to them via sort of surveys that become a, become a very sort of self-perpetuating loop because we know this. I mean, I, I used to work in marketing before I did whatever I'm doing now, right. my general court gesturing that I do in this sort of futures <laughs> economics. I wondered, what, I wondered how you knew so much about marketing, but yeah, there you go. Yeah. And like, you know, surveys, you don't take them seriously at all because, you know, you read these surveys that like, you know, 98% of Generation Z will purchase more cornflakes from a cornflake company yep. that attaches itself to cause X, Y, Z. Uh, yep. And then it then gets baked into marketing strategy and fed back to the consumer. And the consumer now is trained to think that when they are presented with those surveys, this is, they, they should say they will do that. But of course, yeah. Yeah. people are sort of forced into, into saying things they don't actually do. I mean, they, that's not to say they actually are going to stop buying cornflake brands that don't you know, commit to the, the cause du jour. And we, we, get, we get trapped into those things. And I think that that phenomenon, like marketers can become, can become like, uh, you know, drink a bit too much of their own Kool-Aid. I don't want to use more sort of oh. crass metaphors there. And, you know, you sort of, but it's also darker when it gets into the phenomenon of social cooling, which is something I'm very fascinated with at the moment. And social cooling is essentially self-censorship, right? When we don't say uh, things, yeah. or worse than that, when we, that when we don't say things that we want to say because of the, the sort of social consequences we have. And the same thing applies to brands and advertising too. But it's also... Even more than that, when we are starting to engage in compelled speech, sort of committing to things that yes. we don't actually yes. believe in. And yep. of course, that's, that's a sort of dangerous place to be in. But it's also quite 
ironic in that everybody is kind of pretending to believe in the same thing that nobody actually believes in, but no one can, can break the illusion or get out of the loop because everyone's afraid that everyone else actually does believe the story that's yes. being sold. Yes. And I think yes. branding is a great way to sort of have that conversation in a slightly more comfortable way. Because when you start to actually yeah. put real issues into that pot, you, you're setting yourself up to, to do exactly what I've been saying and people are trying to yeah. avoid. Yeah. And, and I think that whole, um, you know, it's interesting that you say that there's that other side to the to social cooling of, you know, being compelled to talk about certain issues. And I, and I think brands very much fall into that trap. And, and almost and get forced into that trap as well. You know, you will see quite often, you know, you would have seen tweets where people will say, oh, why hasn't brand X had anything to Looking say out. about <laughs> Ukraine or whatever, you know, whatever it is that, that they feel that they should have said. And, well, you know, you can't win really unless you, unless you kind of fall into line. And, it's, and it, it is a dangerous um, place to be, I think. So what I was sort of getting to with all of that sort of lead up to it is coming back full circle to what you do and how you have been sort of essentially speaking truth to power in your own industry through being quite funny, which, which does get the point across. So this is something that I do a lot in my work and I've had many conversations and conferences on this particular topic about how when it comes to sort of pointing out the, the various naked emperors running around in our society, we've kind of got two choices. You can address it head on like a prophet, like a Cassandra, right? And sort of point out everybody's flaws. Yes. But that generally yes. tends to get you killed, right? Or you can take the role <laughs> rather <laughs> rather than like, you know, like speaking the truth and getting stoned or getting Socrates, you know, like that, that sort of thing. You can decide to adopt the veil of humor and humor gets you into much closer proximity with with places of power and in a much less threatening way to both yourself and your target market. Quite often wrapping a hard truth in a joke, you're allowed to get away with it. And I find that quite ironic in my work that like profits are not, profits are persecuted for telling the truth, whereas jesters are... (laughs) rewarded for it and conversely the converse kind of applies <laughs> like like jess does actually get in more trouble when they when they don't speak the truth and it's so it's it's, it's quite a quite an amusing phenomenon when you sort of watch this playing out in society but how have you felt in that role because you kind of have been cast in that role due to your work and the fact you put out this book and that's the way your sort of persona on on twitter and social media has has developed as being someone that is quite funny what are the what are the darker and lighter sides of that role? And we all find ourselves cast in these roles in society that you found there. Um, well, I think I think certainly the the more positive side of it is, which is what you've touched on there, is that you know you can punch. I find that I can punch with a velvet glove, essentially. You know, I can say things that I probably wouldn't get away with um, if I just said them straight. Uh, so, you know, there's a really good quote from. I've used, I've mentioned this before in a podcast, I think, <laughs> uh, from GK, GK Chesterton, where he says, um, humour can get in under the door when seriousness is still fumbling at the handle. You know, you, you just kind of, there is this leeway that that you have because, you know, you, you're essentially saying, well, I, I'm, I'm kind of, I am a jester here. I'm not, I'm not trying to be too serious and take things on head on. So that's, that's certainly the more positive side of it. But then you also see, the, the negative side, I suppose, is when you see some of these comedians, you know, whose jokes are beyond the pale and or considered beyond the pale and, and suddenly, you know, they're kind of cancelled for want of a better word um, because, uh, because you know, they're not sort of allowed to get away with their humour. And, and that's, I think it's kind of veering more towards that um, side of things now, which is, which is pretty sad. Um, but, yeah, in general, I think I've, I've, probably being allowed to get away with more than I would have otherwise, which is nice. Yeah. Even even as you say that, in terms of the, the comedian to find themselves with a smaller and smaller Overton window within mm. which to dance, mm. they still have more space than someone that is speaking straight, right? You've got a little bit yes. more time. And that's like, I think, a metaphor I've used with you in the past. Like your, your job is to kind of jam a heel into that Overton window and like just keep it keep it a little bit more open. Like that's if that if you do that, you've already kind of succeeded in, in, in doing something that someone else mm. didn't just by holding the space, even if we can't hope to sort of push that out further but that question of censorship is something that's definitely worth speaking about and I did a 
into intellect salon with Jim O'Shaughnessy a while back where we spoke about this jester profit dichotomy when it comes to trying to trying to talk about difficult topics and you know jesters do get away with it for for a longer time but when they do get caught you know the, the punishment is still there it's like you have to keep them actually laughing because that's the thing when you speak truth all jokes are about truth revealed when, when you actually come down yeah. to it jokes are about truth it is about making us look at ourselves but when they stop laughing that's when you're in trouble right you you're have to trouble. keep them exactly. laughing and like yeah. when we did that, when we did that conversation, the last time around was just after that a comedian in Afghanistan had actually just been murdered, like by oh, the right. by the yeah. state for doing that, which does give us all pause for thought. Like it's it, there's a very fine line about keeping the keeping the crowd laughing and then getting them to getting them past that point where they no yeah. longer find themselves funny or reflected back, because then you have stepped into the role of being prophets or revealer of truth once yes. again, which is a which is a very different role in society. So we all kind of straddling these these divides. But I do think it's interesting coming back to the comedians, at least in the West, where we might be persecuted in terms of our ability to to earn money or have platforms available to us and get involved in the free speech debates, but you're not actually you know, speaking for, for your life or trying to make exactly. sure that you, you, don't, you don't have the, the physical threat yet, although that is changing in certain places with the various new sort of uh, laws that have been, you know, adopted yeah. in terms of making yeah. the crisis work for politicians that want to hang on to power. We've got at the moment a, a very new hate speech bill that's come through in South Africa that was actually yep. signed into law the same week that the Ukraine war broke out. So a lot, under a lot of noise, a lot of these, these sort of, these sort of, the, the constraints are coming in around us. And the problem with these sorts of bills is that they are once again subjective rather than objective, which is something I'm coming back to again here. And the questions, because they relate to questions of morality rather than questions of legality. So, you know, I yes. call them skeleton yep. key laws because they're laws based on offense rather than laws based on offenses, which is a subtlety, but yes. a quite important yes. thing. And offense, offenses can be defined, you know, like stabbing you with a knife is a definable offense whereas hurting your feelings is entirely subjective and completely in the eye of the beholder so there's a whole lot of discretionary content that comes with that i think that's where the the slippery slopes sort of conversations become become more yeah. and more interesting because the rules of engagement are no longer defined and i think that they're no longer defined because of that unseparation that i was speaking about earlier of church brand and state whereas before you know state was about black and white it was about rule of law it was about objective this is what you can and cannot do and whereas church was about issues of morality which is more voluntary and very subjective and should be dealt with on a personal basis and business or brand was supposed to be somewhere as a different pole in that point business has a different levers they don't have the law on their hand but you do have the rights to reserve trade you know for example yes. or to choose who yeah. you hire and who you work with yeah. And it's yeah, more of a, a speaking from. in terms of action. Yeah. But yeah. when we try and conflate those ideas, everybody's power in that those places becomes diminished on the one hand. But yes. on the other hand, everybody's space to move becomes that much less. Yes, indeed. Yeah. Um, yeah. And, I, you know, touching on that, on that uh, hate speech idea, I think, you know, just recently in the UK, I think those, those laws have changed as well. They're in the process. Where, I don't think they've fully come through yet, but they have very right, similar yeah, bowl at what yeah, we've just had. Yeah, yeah. So you'd know more than I would about it. Um, but certainly, you know, it's it, as you say, it's a slippery slope where violence is being come to be, as is starting to become defined as as something well, well beyond physical violence. You know, it's it's kind of we're talking about psychological violence essentially, which or moral violence, as you say. Um, it's unfalsifiable. That, like you can't, you can't disprove that somebody is being hurt is by offended you. Or, yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah. So yes, it's a very tricky, nuanced situation, and and I agree that the constraints are getting greater and greater, and you know, the the freedoms are becoming less. So, uh, you know, this is where it starts to get pretty serious, rather than you know just being the jester. Yeah, it does. And coming back to the brand question again, I think that probably one of the most concerning trends for me is not necessarily being government powers increasing because government is government and power begets power and power rolls up <laughs> unless you pull it down. Yeah. And like we can't expect, As you we can't have expect seen the, the scorpion to act against its nature, right? So you have to yes, understand yes. this. Our role as the private sector, as brands, as business and as individual citizens is to 
resist. That is our role, to, to pay our taxes and no more, right? To use all the loopholes available to us. That is our sort of basic, and to work around the constraints of the law, but not to allow the, the law to continue to, to grow and to reduce yes. the common space that we have to work in. Mm. That's what it should be in a healthy society. You should have a dynamic tension. I think where it gets really concerning is when you start to see big business jumping into bed with big brother, as opposed to holding that space, right? And when we see yes. brands stepping into the political realm in very serious issues, like engaging in things like sanctions, like in Russia now you can't mm -hmm. use your own bank card. I mean, that's mm -hmm. that's a pretty pretty large stick that has been driven by brand sentiment and a lot largely through through perception, right? But it's a voluntary sort of getting yourself involved in the ring and in the realm of a space where there already is a lot of power in place, right? Yes. And yes. I don't I don't know how you you see that playing out with your clients at the moment. Are clients and brands moving into this role of actually becoming sort of policemen or becoming terrier for the government and actually working with the government out of a sense of duty and purpose? Or are they doing it because they kind of feel they kind of have to? Is it, is it a voluntary jumping into the ring or is it more of a, a sense of coming back to that social cooling phenomenon, that sort of compelled speech issue, yes. is that's what's yes. driving. What, what, are your, what is your sense there? Well, I, speaking of our own clients, it, it, we don't really see very much of this. Um, you know, in the healthcare space, it's, it's, I don't, we are quite removed from, from that politicisation, I think, in many ways. Money speaks um, loud. <laughs> pardon? Money speaks quite loudly yeah. in the healthcare sector. Yeah. Right? There's yeah. a lot to be made. So, yeah, it's just, I don't know, it's just a different realm. Um, and But certainly from what I've seen, uh, just in the broader, you know, business community and so on, I would say that it is more more of the compelled speech. I, I think there's so much talk, you know, online and on Twitter, you know, Twitter is probably the classic example. There is so, I think there is a lot of pressure on these brands um, to do it. And I don't, I don't, Think it's necessarily voluntary, um, but by the same token, I get the, I also get the sense that a lot of the people that are in higher positions in marketing within these companies have kind of come up with with a lot of these very similar ideas. Um, whether that whether you're going to call that kind of indoctrination or not, uh, it, they, I don't know. It's hard to hard to say whether they genuinely believe in in these causes or, or whether they feel that they need to be. Um, involved in these calls. I don't know. It's a difficult question. And I've, and I've never really worked for any companies like that. So I, I can't say for sure. But that's Yeah, we don't know. True. And from the outside looking yeah. in, it's clearly happening. We don't know. We don't know what, what those conversations are. But what is your sense in terms of where that compellingness of the compelled speech is coming from? Is it coming bottom up from customers who are demanding? Are the surveys telling the truth? Do customers really insist on, on brands following their own the, the current morality zeitgeist, or is the pressure coming more from the tower, right? From government, like we've seen in the United States, which are quite interesting bellwethers, where you've kind of got the, the press secretary telling companies who and they should and should not do business with, which is a, yeah. which is a, it's quite a, that, that is a bellwether for me. Like when government is actually yeah. telling business how to run business. And that, yeah. that implies yeah. that behind the scenes, there are, if not to, wars and rumors of wars, sort of sanctions and rumors of sanctions and rumors of sticks behind the scenes. So is it the carrot of the customer that's driving brands into the political scene or is it sort of politics that's dragging them um, into it? I suspect it might be from both ends, but um, I think the particularly the consumer sentiment thing, as you say, I think can be a bit misleading. As you would have seen, you know, a lot of market research is so poorly designed. And so, you know, if, if you ask a question of a consumer, well, are you more likely to buy, say, a sustainable brand? Of course they're going to say yes. Or, you know, a brand that is, is doing good for the environment or whatever it is. You know, of course they're going to say yes. But generally speaking, the evidence shows us that their behaviour doesn't, doesn't back that up. Um, and that's probably, you know, that's probably a lesser example than, than what you're talking about but uh generally speaking i think probably the consumer drive is not as strong as what it, well sorry the 
the way that companies respond to what they think is the consumer sentiment is not exactly what the consumer sentiment is. Um, I, I also think there's a lot of, you know, on Twitter, for example, the loudest voices are kind of the ones that you see all the time, um, but that's not necessarily very reflective of, of kind of general consumer sentiment. So those two factors probably play into it, but but I certainly think there probably is a kind of a top-down effect as well. Um, yeah, I'm kind of sitting on the fence there. <laughs> yeah, I don't know. I just thought I'd ask the question. Maybe everyone listening can have a have an opinion there. Yeah. I think that I have a theory, and maybe you can you can tell me if I'm entirely wrong because I have been <laughs> I have I have been insulted largely on Twitter for for, for airing such views. <laughs> but I do have a I do have a theory that brands are not responding to their actual target markets, which is what I was taught to do when I was involved with marketing mm-hmm. the various inessential goods, very inessential goods that I have marketed <laughs> sure. through throughout my career. Like you generally, we used to create communications campaigns to. Try try and match to what our target market, in other words, the people who were actually going to buy our stuff wanted. So we responded to their needs. However, a lot of the politicization of branding, I certainly suspect as a now outsider, because I have not sold anything in a marketing capacity for the last, so not since 2015. So it's been quite a while now. So Mm -hmm. I don't don't know how this is playing out, but I have definitely seen clues on an outsider looking in, especially going back to the early days of COVID, where we had those sort of lists going around of brands that you should not support because they had not done X, Y, Z or had done X, Y, Z. I think it was quite a phenomenon in the UK. They had some here in South Africa too. So my Mm -hmm. theory is that a lot of brands are responding or getting involved in political campaigning and uh, morality marketing, Mm -hmm. not because of their actual target markets, but because of the people who were never going to buy their product anyway. These sort of outsiders, they're almost branding as a defense rather than as offense, whereas advertising traditionally and right up until very recently has been about an offense. You went after your target market ruthlessly and you got them to buy your stuff. Whereas now it seems almost more like a defensive campaign to stop enemies from destroying your brand from the outside. So these campaigns are triggered not at actually getting people to purchase your product, but rather they triggered at protecting your brand from being attacked by people who never would have spent a cent on it in their lives. And I see this play out in South Africa quite a lot. Like we have quite a a militant, they're so far left wing, they're basically right wing now. They wear red uniforms and red berets <laughs> and they're they they they're they're quite um they're, they're like they're quite into like a whole lot of the sort of more extreme sort of authoritarian politics and all the rest of it. Sure. And yeah. brands are very, very scared of them in that they have gone after brands who and this is these are these are people who are definitely not the target market of the sorts of products and brands that that I'm talking about here. They've gone after brands, after restaurants, after businesses who have made morality mistakes in their views. So we see campaigns being taken place to be sort of defensive campaigns to throw bones to these people who were never part of the marketing strategy before. I think this is a fascinating phenomenon playing out. And every time I mention people are like, show me the data. I'm like, I'm a human being. I live in society and I've noticed these (laughs) things. But maybe maybe you've seen this play out or not. You can tell me I'm talking nonsense, but I have a theory that this is playing out. Absolutely, oh, I think I think I don't think there's any doubt about that. Again, I you know I don't have the data to to support you either, but um, certainly from a subjective point of view, I think that's definitely true. You know, I was always taught at, um, at business school that exactly what you described. You know, if you go after your target market, target and market, and your money on cooking your own fish on your bait, yeah, right? <laughs> and, and ideally, you know, ideally you do something that potentially may be so polarizing that, yeah, you know, 30% of people or 50% of people or whatever will hate you, but that's fine because the people that you are going after are the ones who, who are, are going to be buying your products. So it doesn't really matter. I think maybe a lot of the issue is that, uh, you know, things have changed in the last however long, 10 years maybe, with social mm-hmm. media and, and with those that. loud voices. And, you know, I think there probably is definitely a move towards towards that defensive marketing that you describe. Budget. and. and <laughs> yeah, and and I guess you know the the more courageous marketing managers and so on will we, we'll, well we're not I'm not going to worry about that. Um, but you know there are obviously other forces <laughs> affecting them, and and if uh, you know if a, a brand is going to be brought down by by a few loud voices, then then you you know you've got to consider it. So yes, I agree. It's quite crazy, I, right? I so you're basically. True. 
buying off your haters, right? So yeah, like paying money yeah. to people who are not going to spend yeah. anything back on it. And that does, doesn't seem like the most sustainable marketing strategy uh, going forward. Protect, it's a racket. Yeah, a yeah it seems to be like a protection basically. racket. So like yeah. a protection protection money for brands. I certainly yeah. see that playing out. It's sort of like, and that's, that's where you come back to those things. Like, why haven't you spoken out about X, Y, Z issue? Quickly, you've got to find some budget and throw it a throat at that mm. or at least send out that tweet and take expend that effort yep. in order to protect ourselves going forward, which is absolutely fascinating. But I did want to get into something else with you while I do have you here. And that is your experience with COVID just as a citizen of the world. I think we live in two quite extreme polar opposite kind of societies. South Africa definitely tends towards state of nature. Uh, we defunded our police a long time ago. I mean, mm. we still technically pay them, but they don't really work for us anymore, right. for example. And whereas you live in quite the opposite, you live in a much more yeah. Leviathan-esque type society. I think that between the, the extremes of how things played out over the last couple of years, between where you live and where I live, despite having very similar lovely climates, is, is quite interesting from a human point of view. And I do know that, that as, a, as a human being, you probably approach what's going on in the world of politics and all the rest of it very similarly to the way that, you know, you approach your work and, and the way you look at, look at things going on in the, in the ad industry. So I wanted to get your, your sense on what's gone on there and if there is still any sense of humor to be had about what's happened with the, the roll up of power, huh. with the scorpions acting as scorpions act over the last couple of years from your perspective. Yeah, well, it's certainly changed the general mood, <laughs> you know, and, and certainly my, uh, shall we say, perspective on the role of government. Um, you know, I, I don't know how much you know about the particular situation here in, in Victoria and Melbourne where I am, um, but we sort of had a, a particularly severe lockdown, uh, partic well, in 2020 and, and then again last year, really. Uh, and I didn't think that the, the powers of government would ever extend to, to what they did. Uh, so that was a bit of an eye-opener. Um, I think we had a pretty different he experience here to, to other from other parts of Australia. Uh, so it tended to, you know, it, it sort of, the other thing was that it really fragmented the federation in Australia where um, people's approach to, to government and, uh, and their perspective on kind of the Australian federation really changed. And, I, and I, uh, I think maybe it's kind of changed forever in some ways. I don't know. That Maybe that's we'll look back in five years and think that it didn't change that much. But I, I get the sense that it's really um, it's a long-term issue rather than a short-term one. Um, it's, I, I think certainly the, in marketing uh, and in our work even, um, the way that it changed our, our perspective was that Everything had to be serious. You know, you can't, you kind of almost couldn't do anything in a lighthearted way for a while because you, you almost had to acknowledge the fact that, the, you know, the world has changed and, you know, the now more than ever thing and, you know, all that stuff, which, which I kind of took the piss out of for a while and then kind of lost <laughs> uh, the enthusiasm for. Um, but, yeah, I think it did kind of change the way that people approached marketing and, and the way that they, uh, yeah, particularly thought about government and and how business interacts with government and so on. Yeah, it, it was a it's been a strange couple of years, put it that way. How well, have you managed to keep your sense of humour through throughout it all? <laughs> I didn't for a while, <laughs> but, but uh, I think probably by taking looking at some of those things, uh, I I just had to. You know, so the you know you saw all the cliches about the COVID ads and that kind of thing, and and so I did manage to to make light of some of those things. Um, but yeah, it's been tough. It's been you know it really has been a tough time here. Yeah, it has um, been tough. But I, I definitely think that for for myself, and I speak for myself, and maybe other people agree that by looking looking for the ironies and for looking at for the humorous ways to point out some of the the excesses of power that have taken place, it definitely see, feels like you can push push the lever a little bit further in terms of in terms of opening up holding space to have conversations that are not sort of drilled down into very party pack type politics like I always find a great conversation starter with anyone that's taking any of this too seriously is to just remember that the UK government did put out 
a press release on which sexual positions people should That's engage right. in during COVID. <laughs> and it included government mandates at glory right. holes. I mean, at this point, we have to be oh, able to laugh. Right. If we can't laugh, <laughs> if we can't laugh, then we are lost. And I, I definitely appreciate you yeah. taking the piss in your own industry. I hope the people listening to this conversation are a little bit emboldened to take the piss out of their own government when they are caught doing ridiculous things. Ridiculous things should be laughed yeah. at and naked emperors yes, should be pointed absolutely. out by small children all over the place. If we are going yeah. to act shamelessly, we should be prepared to be laughed at. I think the laughter can take us take us a lot further and at least create a bit of common ground and hold a little bit of space to have at least some conversations and to not take ourselves so yeah. seriously. Yeah, yeah. And <laughs> I'd forgotten about that. I'd forgotten about that advice. That's hilarious. Um, but certainly I agree. You know, I think a, the marketing industry has become so earnest, uh, you know, and there's so much bullshit really to you know it's the only way to describe it uh that that it, yeah you're right you have to laugh at it it's 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 become ridiculously uh self conscious in some ways yeah there's, it's just so earnest and you, you know you look back at a lot of the advertising for example from you know from the 50s through to the i don't know 80s but- and so much of it had humor at its core and there's so little of that now. I mean, you know, you still see it, of course, but but it's it's just not there in the same. Doesn't have that same essence, I think. Um, and so that's why that's why I almost have to do it as a bit of a meta now. You know, I have to look at it fr- from above rather than can, kind of inserting it into my work in some ways. Mm. Yeah, but but we have to we have to be able to laugh at people who are being ridiculous. We also have to be able to laugh at ourselves and not take ourselves so seriously. I think that's Definitely. that's the yeah. other thing because we are engaged in the in the world of business in in making money, and if we are engaged in politics, we're in the business of holding on to power. And we shouldn't be we shouldn't we should be called out on that when we try and pretend that we're doing these things for for so other reasons. Something else. Yeah, when it comes exactly. to when it comes to issues of money and power, I'm a great believer in that most of this is this is all it's all about amorality. People get away with what they can get away. <laughs> Away with and they take what they can get right the strong take what they can the weak suffer what they must it's it's it, that borders on the cynical but i think that's just realism yeah. i think that people yeah. respond to incentives and they will also respond to to temptations and to loopholes yeah. and they will be exploited and uh, <coughs> that's that's a lot of what we're seeing here but unfortunately those sort of taking the easy wins and going for the for the cheap causes that get the quick likes and you know defend us against the the angry mobs there there are prices to be paid for that there are prices to be paid in terms of longer term sustainability whether it's of your brand or your or your country Business, or even just yeah, your own yeah. personal credibility so i think that mm. The, the reason that i got you here was to sort of drive those two points home about the importance of speaking your truth but also being able to laugh about it yes yeah yeah well i think well, to get back to one of the points you made there about, you know, what is the purpose really of, of marketing? And Mark Ritson has spoken about this quite a lot. You know, essentially he says, well, you know, the purpose, you know, my, my purpose is to make a shitload of money for companies. That's what I am there for. And you can try and dress that up as much as you want. But if, if you really, if that's not, you know, essentially what you're doing, then you should be in a different industry, <laughs> you know, do something else. Um, and that's the, you know, that's the naked truth of it, really. Um, the naked and, you know, truth not- of it, but it's not as cynical as, as you're making it sound out to be. Because the role of business is, business adds value to society when it adds yes. value to yes. society. Brands can do more for the world by simply de- developing good products and selling them at a fair price and paying your own employees a fair wage. That is the best good a business can do. By charging extra on your product, on your whatever chocolate bar or unnecessary consumer good or high heel shoes that you are selling, in order to take some of that money and deploy it to the cause du jour that is closest to the, the public relations department's heart, you're actually lessening your overall value to society because businesses are good at making products and adding value to your consumers by giving them shoes that make them feel sexy when they put them on. That's it. You've added value to society. When you start to play around and actually have the hubris to think that your CEO and your marketing department 
knows more to do with, with the extra money that they're retaining for, for brand related causes than your customers could do with that money for themselves or that your employees could do with that cash if you gave them a raise. I think that that is absolute hubris. And that's another thing that people, that, that a lot of very serious marketers who take themselves very seriously, them and their CSI departments, <laughs> far too seriously, get very angry about when I point it out. So I'm like, I'm pretty sure yep. that allowing everybody else, that taking a smaller margin and not engaging in vanity projects like painting schools like brands love to paint schools right but children don't need painted schools as much as they might actually need food and if maybe you didn't yeah. take quite as much cash and actually focused on increasing the value of your own product there'd be more money flowing around the world as good old says yeah. laws says so yeah, I'm yeah. quite keen on getting a bit more re-separation of church, brand, and state. Yes. And I think that stakeholder capitalism is probably one of the most disastrous ideas that's going to suck incredible amounts of value out of the hands of people who need it towards people who don't need it, quite frankly. Yes, yes. Whatever, whatever lies that... you tell yourself to feel good about yourself. Exactly, exactly. I think hubris is the perfect word for it. And I think that also is a beautiful link back to, to that book that I described earlier by Steve Harrison. You know, he, he talks about all of this stuff. Um, you know, he's an old, uh, well, you know, he's been in the industry forever. Um, yeah, and he makes that exact point in taking money out of the pockets of your workers and your suppliers and all those, all those things. Which, do you think you which can these, do better with it? Exactly, Imagine. exactly. It is, it is hubris. You're right. You're exactly right. Yeah. And of course, the, choose, the, the causes you choose are not the ones that the rationalists would pick, the really small or really big ones. They're, they're the causes that will get you the most column inches on your press campaign, right? Like, yeah. We know this. Yeah, the exactly. brand-directed charity and stakeholder budgets seldom deploy capital towards the most, if ever, yeah. towards uh, think, better, <laughs> better issues. Yeah, and I think the other side of that is that the industry media is very much complicit in this as well. Um, and Steve also talks about this. Sorry, I, I'm, I'm sounding like a, a fanboy here, <laughs> but, but it's true. You know, I, I think some of the industry media are, are shameless in the way that they also will will pretty much just parrot whatever whatever the you know these uh, senior marketers say. And yeah, it's a it's a bit of a worry. Yeah, no, there's nothing there's nothing virtuous about uh, taking a taking a tax break or or you know applying B Corporation pr practices to your business if you're doing it in order to increase your own, your own profitability <laughs> exactly. or brand awareness yeah. anyway. It's like claiming, yeah. claiming a tax break on char charitable donations. That doesn't make yeah. you a hero. Yeah. That makes you a capitalist. And lean into yeah, that. It's not a, like it's not if you're a, gonna <laughs> you're gonna be a brand that's making making unnecessary consumer goods, lean into that and make the best consumer goods you possibly can for the best price. Yeah. Make yeah. to delight your customers. And, you know, keep your keeper suppliers businesses propped up. And you know what? You're actually doing quite a lot of good in the world, keeping the money flowing around, because that's that's what business does. It keeps things circulating. Focus on that yeah. rather than on yeah. electing politicians and and yeah. telling us what, what to believe in and what not. Yeah. And what's the what's the quote? Uh, a principle is only a principle if it doesn't if it cost you money no i can't remember the exact yeah, quote. value is only value it's got a price yeah. that's the way i like to say it yeah <laughs> kind so. of kind of drives it home yeah if your values are increasing your profitability it's not a value it's a marketing strategy mm -hmm. and good for exactly. you <laughs> yep yep good for you um I have taken up a lot of your time and I was late. I do apologize for that when we started this conversation. <laughs> no but I do always like to give guests the opportunity to have a closing closing words if you want to connect any dots, disclaim anything that you said prior or point <laughs> anyone in direction of anything that you want to punt or promote, please do go for it. And if you can also tell sure. people then where they can find you if they want to connect with you, work with you, or just generally converse with you or not, if you prefer to remain hidden, we respect your privacy too. Well, I'm definitely not hidden. So I think that's probably, that cat's out of the bag. Um, uh, look, I think my, yeah, my general feeling is very much what, you know, along the lines of yours, which I think we need to keep calling out this stuff or, it's just going to get away from us even more so than it has. Um, I, as I say, I think there's, there's definitely a role for, for humour um, in doing that. Uh, and the more that we push back against, you know, that earnestness and, and kind of that hubris, as you say, uh, the better. Um, who would I point you? Well, certainly, I, again, I would point you to, to Steve Harrison. I think uh, he's on LinkedIn. He's very happy to connect with people. 
and his book is excellent. So it's Can't Sell, Won't Sell. It's pretty controversial. He's had a fair bit of pushback on it, um, it. which may Love a band be book. interesting to your <laughs> readers, I think, <laughs> to your listeners, yeah. Um, but he's also he's a fantastic creative. You know, he's, I think he's won more creative awards than anyone in the history of Cannes or something. So, you know, he, he knows what he's talking about as well. Um, it's not just, you know, he's not just on this bandwagon or brand wagon, if you like. Um, who else? Are, oh, I'd point you to Mark Ritson as well. He's fantastic. Uh, oh, and also, if any, I don't know how much uh, your readers will be interested in, in kind of marketing education as well, but he runs uh, a course called the Mini MBA, which is all online. Um, and it's it's essentially his business school course, but, but kind of in 12 weeks or something. Um, so, yeah, it's fantastic. Um, what else? Oh, you can find me on Twitter. So it's Dr. or you know, what am I? At Dr. underscore Draper. Uh, I'm on LinkedIn as well. Um, yeah, probably the main ones. And if if you want to have a look at our website, it's wellmark.com.au. Thank you so much for joining us. Thank you for having me. It was a pleasure. If you enjoyed this conversation, please subscribe to our YouTube channel and rate us on all your preferred podcast platforms. If you'd like to find out more about what we're doing, please join our Substack community via the link in the comments below. And as always, we'd love to hear your suggestions for future guests and conversation topics.